right. Uh, good morning from Central California again. Want to be able to welcome you to another of our Daniel and Revelation studies, going through it verse by verse. Want to be able to begin with a word of prayer. We are running a little behind schedule, but we would hope to cover what we can with our limited time that we have together. Our gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for the privilege of another morning. And we thank you for all the blessings of life that you have given us in spite of who we are. We are grateful for who you are. We thank you for your word that comes to be able to lift us out of the darkness, of the insipidness around us. We don't have to be able to draw in from the miasma of the world, the foolishness of men's rhetoric, and be able to look at that which causes us depression when we see the events that are taking place around us. We are told by the words of Jesus himself that when you see all these things begin to transpire, lift up your eyes to the east for your redemption, draw my I pray, dear Lord, that you will um, quicken our thoughts so that we are looking up to the east and what it means to be able to look up to the east for where our redemption comes from. I pray that you will help us so that we would look that we would keep our eyes fixed upon Jesus, that we would not look, dear Lord, with uncertainty, but that we would look in simple faith, trusting and believing that you who have begun a good work would be faithful to complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. I pray for those who would be watching, may our audio and visual equipment also work without any issues. And I pray for the recording, that your name is glorified through it all. Once again, hide. Uh, behind the sh me behind the shadow of the cross and may Christ be lifted up once again thanking you for hearing and answering our prayers in Jesus name we pray Amen. the last time we were together we had given a brief introduction to Daniel chapter 11 and verse number 40 onwards we did say that there were many different interpretations of Daniel chapter 11 out there but uh, in the understanding of Daniel chapter 11 there are events that are connected with the close of probation. Now, I'm going to be able to share my screen and hopefully you should be able to view and join in the timeline. Looking at the events that are connected with the close of probation like we looked at the last time that which brings us to the end of all time is this vision of Daniel, considered to be the longest of his visions. This vision, of course, began with Daniel seeing this uh, by the river, great river Hedekal, that ends itself in the lake of fire. All right, and that is something that we would be able to understand. As we have seen in the past, we have studied in the past that there are two streams, one leading to heaven, to the tree of life, to the river of life, and then the other to the lake of fire, which God says is prepared for the devil and his angels. You and I do not have to be a part of that particular, uh, that particular stream. Hopefully we would choose to be able to be a part of that heavenly vision of what Christ is doing the heavenly sanctuary about to blot out our sins before the times of refreshing does come from the presence of our Lord according to the book of Acts chapter 3 and verse 17. But as we looked at this, we needed to be able to understand, of course, that while there are different voices out there with their interpretation of Daniel chapter 11, uh, if those of you who have looked at this historically from the perspective of our pioneers, you would understand that there are different perspectives to Daniel chapter 11 verses 40 onwards. Ellen White was clear from verse 30 onwards uh, in saying that this particular vision in Daniel chapter 11 and verse 30 will be repeated to the very letter. So we know according to scriptures, if you were to be able to go with me before we read Daniel chapter 11 and verse 40 to the book of Ecclesiastes chapter 1, Verse 9 says, <clears throat> The thing that hath been, it is that which shall be, and that which is done is that which shall be done, and there is no new thing under the sun. Right? Verse 10 says, Is there any anything whereof it may be said, See, this is new? It hath already been of old time, 
which was before us. All right, so that is something that the Lord has shown us in his perspective of truths that all these things that you and I are looking at is something that has transpired already uh, in the past. In fact, he repeats himself in that same book of Ecclesiastes chapter 3, looking at verse number uh, 14. <clears throat> Remember, when God repeats a certain thing, he does it for a specific reason. He does it because he was to be able to try to help us recognize that we are living indeed in the last uh, portals of this world's history, but then God is establishing a vision, he's establishing a truth, and he's shortly to be able to bring it to pass. All right, looking at what Ecclesiastes chapter 3 says, and verse number 14 and 15, he says, I know that whatsoever God doeth, it shall be forever. Nothing can be put to it, nor anything taken from it. And God doeth it that men should fear before him. Right? And we spent a whole Sabbath studying about what fear is in our Sabbath school lesson this past quarter. So we can be able to understand that the fear of men is not taught by the precepts of men. It needs to be understood as a reverential relationship that we have with our God. But at the same time to recognize that God is holy. Angels wail their faces as they come before him. God who knows the end from the beginning. We need to be able to have that sort of reverential fear that we don't equate with him uh, and us on the same plane because he is God and we are mere uh, created beings. And let us remember that. Verse number 15 says, That which hath been is now, and that which hath already been, that which is to be hath already been, and God requireth that which is past. So what does God want us to recognize? He wants us to recognize the past, that which is driven away, that which has already taken place. That is what we need to study. We need to study history gone by so that we can be able to recognize the history as it unfolds. Go with me again to the book of Jeremiah chapter 6. Again, these are texts that should be familiar to us. Jeremiah chapter 6. This is the description of the doom and its causes of Zion. And we know Zion is a symbol of the church of God that God had established as a people to be able to have a repository and to have a place where people can be able to come to find knowledge of God and his word. He calls it the children of Benjamin. He calls them Jerusalem. But he calls them also Zion. I want you to look at verse number two, first of Jeremiah 6. He says, I have likened the daughter of Zion to a comely and delicate woman. All right. So this is a text that uh, will help us in our understanding of what Revelation chapter 12, Revelation chapter 17, and also Proverbs chapter 1 and chapter 2 talks about when he talks about the woman that is represented there. A woman represents the daughter Zion, daughter of Zion, which is a symbol of the church of God, right? So dropping down, he's talking to this daughter of Zion. He's talking to his church. And you can read in verse number eight, he says, Be thou instructed, O Jerusalem, lest my soul depart from thee, lest I make thee desolate a land not inhabited. Now, we need to recognize that word desolate because that phrase is used many times in the Old Testament. And most of the times that phrase is used in connotation with uh, a place where God had blessed, but then eventually the people had turned their hearts and their minds away from God to worship the gods of this world until finally God says, I would depopulate the area. I would make it desolate. And then he says, they shall thoroughly glean the remnant of Israel as a wine, turn back thine hand as a grape gatherer into the baskets. To whom shall I speak and give warning that they may hear? Behold, their ear is uncircumcised, that it cannot hearken. 
Behold, the word of the Lord is to them a reproach, and they have no delight in it. Interesting how the year is circumcised as well. How is uh, what is the process of circumcision? Isn't that the the foreskin that supposedly has a mark in it that symbolizes that they were to be able to to be separate from the world? Well, the symbol of the foreskin was a symbol of their hearts so as to say to be able to not have anything to do with the things of this world but what has the years got to do with our heart we need to be able to understand that we we believe truths by hearing them by our ears so he says that when i warn them and if they do not heed my my warnings it's as if their ears are uncircumcised i am full of the fury of the lord i am weary of hold withholding in i will pour it upon the children abroad and even upon the assembly of young men together for even the husband with the wife shall be taken the aged with him that is full of days now drop down to verse number uh, 13 onwards for from the least of them even to the greatest of them everyone is given to covetousness and from the prophet even unto the priest everyone dealeth falsely is he talking about truth absolutely he's talking about that which god has given us as information that needs to be given to the world but then it first starts in our hearts they have healed also the scripture says the hurt of the daughter of my people, slightly saying, peace, peace, when there is no peace. Now, God said, sent a message of warning, as we sent earlier. He says, be instructed, O Jerusalem, my soul shall depart from thee. But now he's saying that these priests and these prophets that deal falsely have healed the hurt of my daughter. Now, why does he say heal? Who is it who causes these wounds? Who is it who causes for that particular uh, breach, if you were to be able to say? Hold your finger in Jeremiah 6. We're coming back. I want us to be able to understand what this hurt is that God intentionally inflicts his people by. Now, we often like to be able to receive the blessing of God. We don't realize that the the smitings of God is a blessing as well. When God puts us through trials and tribulations, we need to count it all joy because we know that God is still in our midst. He is still leading us. He is still helping us, reforming our characters. Look at verse number one of Hosea. Hosea chapter six. Verse one says, Come and let us return unto the Lord, for he hath torn and he will heal us. Who is it that causes this tear? It is he. God has torn us. He will heal us. He has smitten and he will bind us up. Why? Well, we'll look at that in a little bit. But then he says, after two days will he revive us. Right? So the process of this is to eventually cause for a revival. And in the third day he will raise us up and we shall live in his sight. Then shall we know, if we follow on to know the Lord, his going forth is prepared as the morning, and he shall come unto us as the rain, as the latter and the former rain upon the earth. So the Lord is preparing our hearts for the close of probation time period. Because we know that the time period of the refreshing, the time period of the rain, is the time period just before Jesus comes. How do I know that? How do I know that the rain is the time just before Jesus comes? Go with me to the book of Acts, chapter 3 and verse 19. Acts chapter 3 and verse 19. How do we know that the rain comes just before Jesus comes? Verse 19 says, Repent ye therefore and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord, and he shall send Jesus Christ, which was before preached unto you. If you look at this particular verse as a timeline, you were to be able to know that the repentance of our sins, the turning away from our useless sense, sense of a bloated sense of our own worth, 
needs to be able to take place. Our sins need to be blotted out because that's what happens when Christ or the high priest is uh, in the most holy place, that the blotting out of sins take place and then the times of refreshing, this time period of the latter rain. According to the book Great Controversy 611, Ellen White tells us that the times of refreshing is this latter rain. We also can read that in the book of Isaiah chapter 58. But looking, going back to Hosea chapter 6, right? So it is God who says that I'm going to be able to bring forth this wounding, but I also will bind you up. That which binds us is the first, the second and the third angel's message. Binds us up as a people. Right now, there are at this period of time in history, there are two bindings up that are taking place. One is that which binds up as sheaves, as Jesus said in the parable, uh, who will be brought in to the barn for the time period of the harvest. But then there is also the binding of the tares that takes place that is to be able to be put aside for the burning. The tares are often gathered together and burnt as the field is cleared up. In verse number 4 of Hosea chapter 6, he says, O Ephraim, what shall I do unto thee? You remember who Ephraim was. It was one of those that took on the, the place of some of the other tribes that was the descendant of Jacob. Ephraim, remember, was one of the sons that was added on to the the lineage of Jacob. It says, O Judah, what have I to do with thee? For your goodness is as a morning cloud, and as the early dew it goeth away. Ephraim and Judah, a symbol of those who have been in in the faith and those that have joined the faith. He says, Your goodness all right, is as the morning cloud. Now, the morning cloud, the last couple of weeks here in Central California, we've been having a very thick uh, fog in the morning. It seemed like it's a morning cloud. And it, as we were driving, we have to be able to be careful on the road because our visibility is less than maybe about 50 to 100 feet. So driving conditions were, were incredibly difficult. But what we did realize is that once the sun came out and the warmth of the sun literally melted those clouds away. We know that Jesus Christ is a symbol of the sun that melts the miasma of the clouds that supposedly eclipse our view of that which is around us. Right? We want to be able to understand that our righteousness must exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees. Therefore, the word of the Lord says, I have hewed them by the prophets, I have slain them by the words of my mouth, and thy judgments are as the light that goeth forth. And then you find that famous passage that Jesus himself quotes from, where he says that I desired mercy and not sacrifice and the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. But they, like men, have transgressed the covenant. They have dealt treacherously against me. Verse number 10 says, I have seen a horrible, horrible thing. Well, let's go back and read verse 9 first. And as, a, as troops of robbers wait for a man, so the company of priests murder in the way by consent, for they commit lewdness. I have seen a horrible thing in the house of Israel. There is whoredom of Ephraim. Israel is defiled. Also, O Judah, he had set a harvest for thee when I returned the captivity of my people. So you find that this process that God has of causing for us to be torn and then healing is God's remedy for, for us to be able to have life back into our, uh, our, our diseased bodies, right? And we found that if we were to be able to want to bring healing to a particular limb or a body part that is has become 
uh, necrotic in its tissue, what do you need to be able to do? You need to be able to introduce circulation there. Sometimes they debride the wound so that there would be healing or there would be blood circulating there. Uh, I would recommend that you were to be able to do, apart from debriding, do fermentations, right? In the hot and the cold. And God also says that there is a spiritual lesson in that he would wish that we were either hot or cold and not lukewarm for us to be able to have life in our systems. Go back to Jeremiah chapter 6. The people that said that they would heal the hurt of my people. Now God is the one who is bringing us these messages that causes us to be shaken in our condition, in our Laodicean condition, where we today realize that Christ is about ready to come and we are not ready. What is it that people say? They say, peace, peace, when there is no peace. I'm reading back in Jeremiah chapter 6 and verse number 14. These are the priests that deal falsely. These are the prophets that have a false message to be able to share. They said that there is a peace that is in the world, that eventually things are going to go back to how they were before. Were they ashamed when they had committed abomination? Nay, they were not at all ashamed, neither could they blush. Therefore, they shall fall among them that fall. At the time that I, that I visit them, they shall be cast down, saith the Lord. Now look at verse number 16. This is where we wanted to be able to be to understand this great vision that the Lord is trying to be able to open our eyes to. He says, Thus said the Lord, stand ye in the ways and see, and ask for the old paths, wherein is the, where is the good way, and walk therein, and ye shall find rest for your souls. But they said, We will not walk therein. God is saying, I want you to be able to return back to me with all your heart. I want you to be able to go back to those old paths, stand in the ways. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. That's a singular about each of those characteristics of Jesus Christ. But then the people say, we will not walk therein. They don't want to be able to study the histories of that which God has given us. Also, verse 17 says, I have set, I set watchmen over you. Also, I set watchmen over you, saying, hearken to the sound of the trumpet. But they said, we will not hearken. What is it that they, they did not want to hear? The sound of the trumpet, the sound of the message of the old paths. We need to be able to recognize what it means to be able to listen to the voice of the trumpet. When is the trumpet sounded? When is it that uh, the watchmen are laid up as uh, guards, people to be able to sound a trumpet-like message? And that which the message that we were to be able to hear from these watchmen are the message of the old paths. Today, we find and hear many voices in Adventism. We hear many voices in the church, all of them pointing to different directions. Nobody knowing with certainty what is soon to break upon this world as an overwhelming surprise. We know that Jesus is about ready to come. But prior to Jesus coming, he will have a people. He will have a people that says, this is our God. We have waited for him. Meaning that they have had an experience with God, that he will tear their, their wickedness out of their heart and then give them a heart that pulsates with love. Give them a life that is willing to be able to follow the Lord wherever he may lead. Interesting how that is the characteristic of the 144,000 in Revelation chapter, uh, chapter 7 and also in Revelation chapter 14. As we were to be able to read in these passages, we were to be able to recognize essentially that there is a great nation that comes from the north that tries to be able to cause for the people to have a sleep-like existence in their spirituality. Looking at verse number 22, let's start from verse number 21. 
Actually, let's go back. Look at verse number 19. Hear, O earth, behold, I will bring evil upon this people, even the fruit of their thoughts, because they have not hearkened unto my words, nor to my law, but rejected it. All right? So God said in the previous verses that they would not walk in the old paths. They would not stand in the ways of the Lord. They would not hearken to the voice of the trumpet. And now he says, they don't hear my words. They don't hear my law. They reject it. So God's old paths, God's sound of the trumpet is a return back to the worship of the true God. In keeping his Sabbath the way that we need to be able to keep the Sabbath. The Sabbath needs to be kept from sunset on Friday evening to sunset on Sabbath evening or Saturday evening. We don't need to be confused about that because the Lord has already shown this in many languages of the earth. That the word Sabbath means rest and often connotates the seventh day of the week. It says, to what purpose cometh there to me incense from Sheba and the sweet cane from the far country? Your burnt offerings are not acceptable, nor your sacrifice is sweet unto me. When we come to church, we think that as long as I give my tithe, my offering, I've done my due diligence. There is uh, now no need for me to be able to do anything more. The Lord doesn't need to be able to take my heart. Is the Lord interested in burnt offerings and sacrifices? The burnt offerings and sacrifices were for us so that we could be accepted before the Lord. But if our hearts are not given to the Lord, if we are not willing to rend ourselves away from the things that bind us to the things of this earth, we find essentially that God says that I find your offerings abominable. They are not acceptable to me, he says. Therefore, thus says the Lord, behold, I will lay stumbling blocks before this people. Verse number 21. And the fathers and the sons together shall fall upon them. The neighbor and his friend shall perish. Now, there's a lot that is here that I think we can be able to take some time on another time to study what stumbling blocks are. But I would recommend that you take your time to be able to look at what it means to have these idols in our heart, that which causes a stumbling for the father and the sons. Thus saith the Lord, Behold, a people cometh from the north country, and a great nation shall be raised from the sides of the earth, and they shall lay hold of bow and spear. They are cruel, they have no mercy. Their voice roareth like the sea, and they ride upon horses set in array as men of war against the order of Zion. Now, you can be able to continue to be able to read what this particular passage has to be able to say in your time. I'm going to recommend that you do because you will find that the message to ancient Israel as it was then and that represented the nation of Babylon that was to be able to come as from the north country. We find that as we come to the end time and God's message to modern Israel that there is a similar message of someone who comes from the north. So the message that we were to be able to study is a pertinent message in Daniel chapter 11. The message that finally shows us the rise of the king of the north in our generation. So as we spend time studying Daniel chapter 11, and some of you probably wondered where this study was going because it seemed like it was never ending. Remember, we have to be able to return back to the old paths. We study our history from which God shows us in Daniel chapter 11. And of course, it doesn't begin with with the rise of Babylon here, but is the subsequent nation after Babylon, which was Medo-Persia. But then Daniel's uh, objective was, in the understanding of that which the angel gave him, was to be able to show us the events connected with the close of probation. I'd like to be able to show you a quote, right? This is taken from... The Pen of Inspiration in the book Great Controversy, page 594. Ellen White tells us the events connected with the close of probation and the work of preparation for the time of trouble 
are clearly presented. Now, where are the words and the information that we need to be able to know how to be prepared for the time of trouble clearly presented? It's presented in the word of God. It's presented in the history that has gone by. But multitudes have no more an understanding of these important truths than if they had never been revealed. What are we doing as a church today? We're playing games. Unfortunately, that is what is happening not only in the Adventist church, but in the churches of the world as well. That nobody has a perspective of that which is soon to break upon this world as an overwhelming surprise. We all are busy with our own little circle of things that are taking place. Now, as we studied this the last time we were together, we understood that in Daniel chapter 11 and verse number 40, we broke this into two parts. We understood that at the time of the end, the king of the south in verse number 40 of Daniel chapter 11 says that he shall push against him or at him and the king of the north shall come right so who was this king of the south that pushed at him at the time of the end we found out that the time of the end according to what ellen white says in 356 of the book great controversy that time of the end was the end of a prophetic time period which was at the end of the 1260 years the 1260 years is called the time appointed it's also called the many days it's the time times and dividing of times it is the 42 months all right there are many references to the 1260 years it's the time period of the wilderness, according to Revelation chapter 12 and Revelation chapter 17. It's the time period where God's people are clothed with sackcloth. Well, essentially, he said, uh, John the Revelator says in Revelation chapter 11 that these are the two witnesses that are clothed in sackcloth, the Old and the New Testament, where Bibles were taken away. They were not publicly uh, allowed to be read. It was this period of the Dark Ages for 1260 years. That period of time came to an end in 1798. So that time of the end was the end of that particular 1260 period. As we understood this from our study the last time we were here together. But then we found that as in 1798, there was a new power that seemed to take ascendancy over the earth and that power was under the french uh, emperor napoleon who sent his general berthier to be able to take the pope captive and if the pope was not willing to be able to well he was supposed to relinquish his power and if he was not willing to relinquish his power then the Pope was to be taken captive and we found that that's what happened in February of 1798 where the Pope was taken captive and essentially uh, died in captivity and we know and we understand that no longer is this talking about it now in a literal sense but we are talking about the rise of the King of the South in a spiritual sense. Right, and we, we need to be able to understand this hereafter because there are a lot of people that make this out to be literal and they're reading through the writings of Uriah Smith and Stephen Haskell, material that is actually powerful in every perspective, but you have to remember that they were writing it for their generation during their period of time where they believed that Christ was coming in their generation. So all their prophecies were centered around the events that were connected with their time period. So in their time period, essentially, they were looking for a literal fulfillment of these events. But for us, upon whom the ends of the world are come, we know that the king of the north now is a spiritual power. No longer is it representing literal Babylon because literal Babylon does not exist. Many have tried to be able to raise up literal Babylon from the time of the Kaisers, from the time of Saddam Hussein, and all the others who decided to be able to make for themselves a name in history. 
right? That was a spiritual rise to power at the end of the world. And we have studied the progression of the rise of the King of the North in Daniel chapter 11. And we know that it represented the papacy at the end of the world. But who was the King of the South? We said the King of the South represented Egypt back in time. And whoever controlled Egypt, because geographically speaking, it was in, in, in relation to Israel. But after the Lord said, after Jesus said, go with me to the book of Matthew, chapter 23, and verse number 37 onwards. Jesus, with heart-wrenching agony, says in verse number 37, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem. Remember, every time we find something repeated through scriptures it is because God is about ready to be able to bring judgment upon a certain event or place and he's shortly to be able to bring the words to pass but then it's also a reference to us upon whom the ends of the world are come he says O Jerusalem Jerusalem thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee how often would I have gathered thy children together even as a hen gathers her chickens under her wings, and ye would not. Remember, as we read in Jeremiah, they would not hear, right? They would not hear the words of the Lord. They would not return back to the old past. They would not learn the ways that the, that the Lord was to be able to show them. Verse number 38 says, Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. Chapter 24, verse 1 says, And Christ went out and departed from the temple. And that is the most saddest statement that there is in the Bible. That God would leave, that Christ would leave the temple and depart from it. Now there are phrases throughout scripture where words are used. I think that there is a word called Ichabod in the Old Testament that says that the glory is departed. We find that not only in the Old Testament, but in the New Testament, that Christ had left his people because they had rejected him. Isn't that what God says? He says that because you have rejected me, I would reject you in, in Proverbs chapter 1. As we come closer to the end time now, we find that no longer is the focus of attention on Israel, literal Israel, where everybody's eyes are, of course, we go there, we like to be able to study history, so we have a lot of interest in that location, geographically speaking. But what are we studying about? We're studying about the future. We're studying about things where we are today. And today, we are ancient Israel. Where is ancient Israel today? It is in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Now, you and I can be able to understand that the Seventh-day Adventist Church today, considering that we've been given the same charter, we've been given the same message, we've been given the same covenant relationship that we ought to enter into with our Lord, we need to recognize then if the Seventh-day Adventist Church Israel is Israel, who is spiritually now the King of the North and who is spiritually the King of the South. Because as we come to the end of Daniel chapter 11, this is the focus of what we need to understand. Like I said, there are many who were to be able to give their own interpretation of the thing. And we looked at a few uh, spiritual connotations of this in Revelation chapter 11. And this is what the passage is on your screen as well. Uh, and we looked at this and we studied about it from Revelation chapter 11 the last time we were together. This period of the time of the end is this time period close to the end of the 1260 years where in Revelation 11 and verse number 3, you can be able to read the verses before that because it said in verse number 2 that God said, the court that is without the temple, leave out, measure it not for it's given to the Gentiles and the holy city shall they tread underfoot 42 months. 42 months is 1260 years. All right. Well, prophetically speaking for a day and a year in its connotation, but 538 to 1798 was also 42 months in uh, its connotation or 1260 days, the many days. But looking at what he says in verse 3 onwards, he says, I will give power to my two witnesses, right? That which they were trampled underfoot. 
But they shall prophesy for a thousand two hundred and three score days clothed in sackcloth. Forty two months, thousand two hundred sixty days uh, are still the same time period. There are two olive trees, two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. And you can read this through the Old Testament, what these two olive trees are and who are the two candlesticks. We find that these are the Old and the New Testaments. And this period in history in Revelation chapter 11, the Bible, of course, has been available for people to be able to read the Old and the New Testament. But he says, if any man will hurt them, fire proceeded out of their mouth and devour their, their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. They have power to shut heaven, that it rain not in the days of their prophecy, and have power over waters to turn them to blood, and to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. So this is another clue to be able to help us understand that this is talking about the Old and the New Testaments, because who is it that had power over the rains? That was the power and the time period of Elijah. And the power over waters to turn them to blood, that was in the time period of Moses. So we have Moses and Elijah at the end of time that will come back again, right? The law and the prophets, so as to say. This is the Old and the New Testament. When they have finished their testimony, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. Who is this beast, right? This beast essentially was France, and we will look at that statement in just a little bit. But looking at what she says, I'm sorry, looking at what John the Revelator says in verse number 8 of Revelation 11 says, And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where our Lord was crucified. And I want you to keep that in mind. Because was the Lord crucified in Sodom and in Egypt? Right, And we understood as we studied this the last time and based on what Ellen White also has to be able to say about this, she says the great city whose streets the witnesses were slain and their dead bodies lie is spiritually Egypt. It's not literally Egypt, it's spiritually Egypt because it's the place where people had neglected to be able to hear the word of the Lord by saying we would not want to listen to those messages anymore. I don't know who God is. This is atheism. This was the situation with France. Um, now, Ellen White, in our previous statement, we found, she says, this is a new manifestation of satanic power because the manifestation of satanic power initially was the symbol of the woman, was the symbol of the beast power, right? But then you find this beast power that ascends out of the bottomless pit was to be able to rule the church, uh, was actually to bring the punishment of God on the power that ruled the church and state for many years, which was the papacy. All right. So we know in history that this particular power that rises up out of the bottomless pit. Now, this is Great Controversy 269 and 270. She says this is atheism. And the nation represented by Egypt that would give voice to a similar denial of the claims of the living God and would manifest a like spirit of unbelief and defiance. The great city is also compared spiritually to Sodom. The corruption of Sodom is in breaking the law of God was especially manifested in licentiousness. And this, this sin was also to be a preeminent characteristic of the nation that should fulfill the specifications of the scripture. This prophecy had received a most exact and striking fulfillment in the history of France during the revolution in 1793, right? And we know that the French Revolution eventually led on to where they did not want to be able to have anything to do with even the semblance of Christianity, even that which considered itself to be Christian, which was the visible power of the the church and state together in the papacy even though the papacy uh, is not essentially christian but they profess to be the the vicar of christ he professes to be the vicar of christ and according to the spirit of prophecy and the bible we know he's called the man of sin right this compromise between paganism and christianity resulted in the development of the man of sin Foretold in prophecies is opposing and exalting himself about God. This gigantic system of false religion is a masterpiece of Satan's power. 
a monument of his efforts to seat himself upon the throne to rule the earth according to his will. Right, and we know that this was referring to the passage in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And you can be able to read that. This was the masterpiece of Satan's deception. But that power in 1798, in the time of the end, was to be able to show us that the king of the north was the papacy that ruled spiritual Babylon. But the king of the south in 1798, under the leadership of Napoleon, was France, the power that ruled spiritual Egypt. Okay, hopefully this makes some sense. And we need to recognize that as we were to be able to read in Daniel chapter 11 and verse number 40, the time of the end was 1798. Okay, the king of the south was, was France, supposedly called at one period of time the eldest son of the papacy, because it was France that essentially, essentially, uh, brought down all the other uh, barbaric tribes, all right? And we know that France helped to be able to uproot three of those other horns and convert all the others to Catholicism, all right? And we know and we understand that France was given a preeminence until so much so that when God was taken out of the picture, they had turned against everything that constituted religion. And we find the same thing that's happening today. We find the thrust that if we were to be able to remove God from our schools, God from homes, God from, from our community, and we focus on, excuse me, and we focus on commercialism instead and materialism instead, that we can somehow have the history of that time period repeated in our day and age as well. So as we come to the understanding of Daniel chapter 11 and verse number 40, we know that it's this power in 1798 in the time period of the end, which is very close to our time period, right? And this is what we said earlier in 1798, the French armies under General Louis Alexander Berthier marched on Rome, which had been declared a republic by Roman revolutionaries in league with the French and demanded that Pope Pius renounce his temporal sovereignty. At his refusal, the Pope was taken prisoner and first held in Siena and ultimately in Valence, France, where he died in exile. And this was from 2002's uh, Encyclopedia and Carter. Right. What do we call this? We call this the deadly wound of Revelation chapter 17. Go with me there as we start to be able to wind our study down for today. And we will pick it up again the next time we come together. Uh, we, we were hoping to be able to go forward, but let's possibly take this up at another time. Right want you to be able to look at this woman in Revelation 17, whom John was invited by one of the seven angels that had the seven wiles, and who tells him in verse 1, Come and I will show you the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters. We know that waters is a symbol of people. We find that the largest denominated church on earth is the Roman Catholic Church with the wicker of Christ supposedly in its place upon whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication and inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of a fornication. The doctrines and the political connections of the wicker of Rome supposedly was to have made the world drunk with her, her, her doctrines, her, her sophistries. So he carried me away in the spirit in the wilderness, saw a woman sit upon a scarlet colored beast, full of the names of blasphemy upon seven heads and ten horns. This period in the wilderness, we know and we mentioned this, is the, 17, uh, is the 1260 years that began in 538 and ended in 1798. So 
where was John taken in vision in Revelation chapter 17? Was it in 538 in the beginning of the, the experience of the wilderness? Or is it in maybe the middle or closer to the end of this period of time? We find that she is a woman who is already fully developed. She seated upon the beast that is God full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. So we know that this was not something at its inception. This was something that was fully developed. The beast was fully developed. The woman was in control of the beast. Now we know that the beast, according to Daniel chapter 7, we know it represented political powers. A woman represented a church from our study that we start we saw today in the book of Jeremiah chapter 6. So he says that I saw uh, that he considered Zion to be a delicate woman. We find that the woman in biblical prophetic narrative represents his people or a church, a religious organization. We find that this woman is the woman who was clothed in uh, scar was clothed in purple and scarlet color and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls. Interesting, she does not have the color blue on her garment, which is faithfulness to the commandments of God. Uh, you can be able to study in numbers uh, what the color blue represents. Uh, you can ask me about that and we'll talk about colors in the Bible. You find that she has a beast that she sits on that has scarlet in it. Remember Scarlet in Isaiah, he says, your sins be as scarlet. So scarlet is the, son of, uh, is the color of sin. We find that this particular political power is stained with sin. It's got names of blasphemy in it, right? which was the political power of the papacy. We find that the papacy is called God here on earth. Right? And this symbolism of the woman represents that power. Uh, she is a pretty rich church. We find that today the richest church that is there available for uh, anyone to recognize is the Roman Catholic system. We know that their control of not only the pharmaceutical companies, the banking industries, even the alcohol industry today is owned by the papacy. Having in her hand, in her having the golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornications. Continue to read. It says, Upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots, the abominations of the earth. So if she is already a mother, she is the abomination of the earth. We know that this is closer to the end of the 1260 time period. This was closer to 1798. This was the time period when... Uh, birth year was about ready to be dispatched. Now it took birth year some time from the time period when uh, Napoleon had issued his command that birth year had carried out his order. That finally he reaches uh, Rome in February of 1798. Uh, verse number six says, I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints. Another indicator that you don't get drink drunk in the beginning of your drinking binge you get drunk towards the end of your drinking binge so this woman that was drunken with the blood of the saints with the blood of the martyrs of jesus and when i saw her i wondered with great admiration and the angel said unto me wherefore didst thou marvel i will tell thee the mystery of the woman and of the beast which carrieth her which hath the seven heads and ten horns the beast that thou sawest was and is not, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world, when they beheld the beast that was and is not, and yet is. I want you to be able to remember that, because as you and I understand that this particular beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit was at one time one where it was in the world, right? and then eventually goes into perdition. We find that the woman was not the one who goes into perdition. The Catholic Church continued to be able to remain as a religious power even during this time period of when the papacy was dethroned from the political arena of the world. It was that which took their political arm out of the way. 
that caused them to be able to go into perdition. Go back with me to Revelation chapter Revelation chapter 13. Revelation 13. And you can be able to read this in your time, but I want you to be able to understand the relation that we have seen as the deadly wound that is in the scriptures. Verse number one says, And I stood upon the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns. The same description as we read in Revelation 17. And upon his horn ten crowns, and upon his head the names of blasphemy. Right? It's talking about the political power that we talked about earlier that was under the control of the woman. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, his feet like the feet of a bear, and his mouth is the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. Now, those of you who have been following with us with the progression of these truths, you understand that this is the rise of the king of the north. All right. And we know that this was Babylon. This was Medo-Persia. This was Greece that eventually controlled Babylon. And eventually the power that came on to rise on the scene of action was Rome, right? And the dragon, which was Rome, essentially, and then uh, in a primary sense was the devil, but we know in the secondary sense was pagan Rome, gives the power, seat, and authority to the one who rises up out of the sea. Okay, we find it interesting because in Revelation 17, the woman sits upon many waters, or she sits upon the beast that is on many waters. Verse number three says, And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast, and they worshipped the dragon which gave power to the beast, and they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? And you can be able to continue to read that this particular beast's power was to be able to, uh, to continue for 40 and 2 months, the 1260 years. So still talking about the same uh, same power that he opens his mouth in verse 6 in blasphemy against God, to blaspheme his name, his tabernacle, and them that dwell therein. All right? And then you can be able to read that in verse number 11 onwards that another beast rises up to be able to speak like the dragon and then he points people back to the beast that receives its deadly wound and that is our time in history so as we were to be able to study and i'm not going to get into that detail now but i wanted you to be able to understand that which we are looking at the fulfillment of these events taking place around us the the deadly wound essentially that took place in 1798 with france cutting off the political arm of the papacy. One of his heads were dead, was wounded, all right? And that we understand today as being the, the deadly wound. But the Bible says that that wound would heal. And that's what it is that we are going to continue to study in Daniel chapter 11, where the healing of that deadly wound takes place. And even now, well, a lot of people say that that particular healing has already taken place with the Concordat signed by Mussolini in the 1930s in giving back to the papacy his lands that were stripped away from them. But no, that's not the, the, the healing of the wound that we are discussing because the wound essentially was made upon the political arm of the papacy that controlled the whole world. We're going to find that that particular control of the whole world will be given back to the papacy again. And one of the ways they were to be able to do it, and we understand, is in the stripping away of religious liberties. They started first by taking away people's liberties. And then you find the religion also will be dictated too, with mandates of various kinds for healthcare being enforced on people, people's uh, fear of diseases nerve instead of looking at the word of God, instead of following the law of God, instead of looking at the old paths, we find that today people are looking to the world, to a place where they can be able to find relief for themselves. So as of always, we hope and pray that 
your minds have been enlightened as you tasted a little bit of this honey. I know there's a lot that we covered in today's study. You would hopefully take the time to look at uh, these messages again and that you would allow for these truths to, to become a living reality, that Jesus would be the, the one who leads us back to an understanding of these truths that we don't have to be confused, that it doesn't have to be a time period of an overwhelming surprise for us, that we can be a, we can look up and say that this is our God, we have waited for him, right? Hopefully the study has been an encouragement to your heart as it has been for us as we do it here uh, for you frequently, right? Let's close with a word of prayer. Our gracious Father in heaven, we want to thank you, dear Lord, that you have used the foolishness of man's wisdom to be able to reach people where they are. I pray asking for forgiveness of our sins, that we have lived for ourselves, thought for ourselves, and even decided for ourselves. I pray, dear Lord, that you will help us so that we can be able to see the King upon his throne and believe that all the plans that he has made for us is to prosper us even if he was to be able to tear and he was to be able to cause us trial and distress to come upon us, that we are not afraid, that we will trust and believe in his word, that we will follow his counsel with regard to what to do for uh, eating and drinking and treatments and worship, that we would follow him whithersoever he leads. Thank you once again for the study. And I pray that the words would not return back void without accomplishing its purpose, that you would allow these truths to be able to gain credence around the rest of the world. And we know, dear Lord, that this message is not a hate message, but is a message of warning, is a message to be able to wake people up, to be able to tell them that Christ is about ready to come, and that we ought to be able to show people how they can be ready for the times of the great refreshing before Jesus comes. Thank you for hearing and answering our prayers today. In Jesus' most sweetest name we pray. Amen. All right, if you'd like to be able to join us, our next study will be with Dr. Clark later this evening. Uh, we will be studying about the implication of what it means to shut down churches. Uh, Forsake Not the Assembling is the name of the study that we're going to look at at 5 o'clock this evening in Californian time. Uh, in India, I think it will be 5.30. Tomorrow, the time will change. Uh, I want to be able to let those in California know to set your clocks back by an hour. Um, I think it happens close to 2 o'clock in the morning uh, tomorrow, but you want to be able to join us for our study nevertheless uh, at 7 o'clock uh, Californian time. It will be still 7.30 in India, regardless in your time zone or whatever it is there. But uh, join us, if you will. The study that we're going to do tomorrow will be our no-nonsense Bible study. But we use these opportunities that we have to be able to carry this message and understand these truths before it's ever too late. May the Lord bless and keep you and your homes and your families as we study and prepare for what is soon to come upon this world.